Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press 1. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number is 692411. 692411. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers? Uh, no. The company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, OK. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John? Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4, that is, normal size envelopes. White, yellow or manila? Um, we'll have the plain white, please. Uh, but the ones with the little windows. OK. One box, A4, white. Just the one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um, as a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white then. Something else, John? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are 500 sheets to the pack. Right, let's see. Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists, so can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. The woman asks the man if he needs anything else. To ten. Now listen to their conversation. Anything else that we can help you with? Um, uh, let me think. What else do we need? Uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Yeah, ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right. Floppy disks. And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already and it's a good idea to order early. Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. OK, can you include a wall calendar then, uh, with the other stuff? Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't, but could you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And um, when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. 
Can you make sure that it's not after 11.30am? Because I have to go out at 12. There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note on the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past 11. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about a printing process. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. As I've made clear in earlier lectures, many different solutions have been proposed to the basic technological problem of getting meaningful marks onto paper. In other words, several different forms of printing have developed over the years, many of which are still in use today for different purposes. This week, I'd like to discuss the rotogravure process. This is one of the most widely used printing processes, and after describing how the process works, I'll be describing some of its industrial uses and the advantages and disadvantages of this form of printing. As the name implies, rotogravure is a form of printing in which large cylindrical pieces of metal rotate, while the paper to be printed passes between them. The paper is held in place against the printing surface by the impression roller. The weight of this roller is one of the factors that affect how much ink is actually transferred to the paper. Remember that this roller does not directly transfer ink onto the paper. The side in contact with the impression roller remains blank, and it's the other side of the paper which is actually the printed side. The impression roller presses the paper against the ink-bearing roller generally known as the gravure cylinder. This roller is etched or engraved using either a laser or a diamond-tipped etching machine. This creates a large number of tiny holes in the surface of the roller which hold the ink. The depth and size of these holes determines how much ink is picked up from the ink fountain, which the whole printing assembly rests in. How much ink is picked up in turn determines the density of the image produced. As it rotates, the lower roller picks up more ink on its surface than is required, and this needs to be removed before contact with the paper. A flat edge, called the doctor blade, scrapes against the surface and removes all ink which is not in one of the holes on the surface of the lower roller. This should lead to a clean image. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now that we understand a little of the mechanics of rotogravure printing, I'd like to look at it in the wider context of the printing industry and discuss the main uses. One of the main advantages of the rotogravure process is that the amount of ink which can be transferred to the paper is high compared to other printing methods. This means that a broad density range can be produced, 
In other words, with rotogravure, it's possible to produce many different light and dark shades, making it particularly suitable for reproducing photographs and fine art. For shorter print runs, some other processes may give a finer image, but rotogravure is ideal for jobs that involve printing, for example, a million magazines. One common place where you'll see printed matter that has been produced by rotogravure is in the advertising material that is often inserted into Sunday newspapers. Of course, it's not just paper that can be printed by rotogravure. It's a very flexible process, since the rollers used can be made to any size required. Whether it's consumer packaging or large rolls of floor covering that need to be printed, rotogravure is a relatively cheap, quick method that is used in a variety of industries. This isn't to say that rotogravure is without its disadvantages. Probably the main drawback is the fact that, with large areas of colour, the dots are visible, even without using any kind of magnifying aid. Now, does anyone have any questions about the rotogravure process? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a conversation among two students and their tutor about the presentation they are going to make at the tutorial class. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Right, Jason and Karen, uh, how are your presentations for the next tutorial class? Um, I feel a bit nervous. I haven't done that before. Although many of my classmates in the same tutorial group have finished theirs. But I think them a little uninteresting because they just read out their notes. I hope mine will be more attractive it and... seems you have a higher demand for yourself. As for me, I have no sense of uneasiness because I made one last semester. But I feel no sense of satisfaction about it. It lacked strong arguments, I think. How much did you get for the last presentation, Jason? Eighty-three percent, actually. But my goal for the next one is over eighty-seven percent. It's pretty good. What is your topic for this one? Uh, strategies for reading. I feel my biggest problem is in the reading speed, rather than vocabulary, which is most students' problem, though. I am slow, especially in reading articles on my f major courses. They are complex and dull. Mm, have you found any effective methods? Well, I am not quite sure. I suppose to skim the books or articles is a... Uh, good approach. Yes, by skimming the book first you get the choicest parts. It saves a lot of time. You don't have to read every word of the passage, but you have to learn to read certain parts intensively. Yes, I include that in my presentation. There is one thing I'm not clear yet. Why don't we make presentations more related to our major? Once you learn to write clearly, read analytically, and listen to lectures effectively, You'll begin professional tutorials. That means you should start from the basics. Well, Karen, how is your presentation? 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Oh, Karen, how is your presentation? I am still in a panic. I want to find some more interesting topics about writing, but I wonder what articles I can refer to, because there are so many of them. Did you get the list of the reading materials handed out last class? Yes, but there are over 20 on it. I have only a week to prepare, so I wonder if Okay, could... let me give you some suggestions. You needn't read them all, because some of them deal with the same issue. The article by Hallsworth is really worth reading. It covers the aspects of organising the thoughts and ideas. OK, Hallsworth. You should also read the article by Jackson. But just look at the part on research methodology, now how they did it. Right, I'll read that one. You should also read the article by Fisher, but just look at the part on the writing plan. That is, how to plan your writing in a systematical way. OK, Fisher, got that. Um, and if you have time, the one by Risewell says very relevant things. It teaches how to title your articles and make it appealing. You should finish the whole book. OK. Now, the one by Burns, if I were you, I wouldn't bother with the whole passage. Just read the conclusion, which summarises the use of rhetoric. Oh, now I understand. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The word thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's thesaurus is linguist Dr Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language. Well, the 150th edition has just come out. It sold 32 million copies. Yes, that's right, 32 million. What is it? Roger's Thesaurus. Now, Roger's Thesaurus is a type of dictionary in which words with similar meanings are grouped together. The word Thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's Thesaurus is linguist Dr Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language but what do we know about the man himself? Well, Mr. Roger, or to give him his full name, Peter Mark Roger, was a very interesting man indeed. He grew up in London, he was French, and he spent his early life in a French community there. He later travelled all the way from London to Edinburgh to study medicine at the university there and graduated when he was 19 years old. 
and he later went on to become a founder of Manchester Medical School. So his life focused around his career as a doctor. Well, actually, no. Roger had a very wide range of interests, indeed. In fact, he was a writer and wrote about many topics such as bees, the kaleidoscope, and even perception and feeling in animals. And he was an inventor too. In fact, in 1814, he invented an early version of the slide rule. The slide rule? Yes, the device that can calculate numbers. Then, ten years later, he developed a prototype for the cine camera, and he also got involved in a range of different projects. For example, he became head of a commission investigating London's water supply, and he developed a method of water filtration through sand. And he was involved in the area of education. He was one of the founders of London University. And do you play chess by any chance, Mark? Yes, I do. Well, Roger invented the travelling chess set. So next time you're playing a game of chess on a train, you have Mr. Roger to thank. So. How did he actually find the time to classify the English language? Well, he only turned his full attention to the thesaurus when he retired, and that was when he was in his seventies. So, what inspired him to write the thesaurus? Well, Roger believed that he should bring as much happiness and knowledge to the greatest number of people. So, during his career as a doctor, he gave free treatment to patients who couldn't afford to pay. We also know that he set up a clinic to help poor people to recover from operations and serious illnesses. Basically, he wrote the thesaurus to help people learn. He aimed to help those who needed practice in writing. He believed that writing skills would help people become more independent and lead happier lives. How popular is the thesaurus today? Well, it was first published in 1852, and it has never been out of print since. In fact, the book has become more popular with each edition that comes out. The invention of the crossword puzzle in 1913 certainly helped to increase the sales figures, though. I think the main reason why it is so popular is that it's thematic, so you can come across words that you've never even thought of when you began looking for the word in the first place. Thanks, Cindy. Now join us again after this short break when I'll be talking to Derek Spode, chairperson of East Anglia News. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.